Hi, everyone. It's George LaRock. Welcome back to Work Tech. Um, we've got a great conversation that I'm really looking forward to today. Uh, I'm joined by Sultan Saidov, the co-founder and president of Beamery. And he's here to talk about their recent announcement, leveraging um, generative AI and large language models within their talent platform. And uh, this is something that's on everybody's mind. And rather than me pontificating about it, I thought, let's get some people that are actually doing something with this technology to tell us what they're doing and what we sh what we should be thinking about. So Sultan, great, great to have you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, George. Excited to talk about this. Yeah, cool. So, um, so why don't we start with your announcement? Um, I, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, I wasn't surprised to see it because I know AI is not new to Beamery. Um, uh, I was excited to see it. So, what, what? Tell everyone what what you announced and and you know what all you're doing over there. Yeah, of course. So we announced Talent GPT, and as you say, we've been working on AI models for. Uh, six, seven years now. And the there's a number of things that are new. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll start with what Talent GPT is uh, as part of that breakdown. So we started working with large language models in 2018, which is when the generation of what we think of as this sort of chat GPT style latest wave of innovation really kicked off. Um, and this is actually, um, when we started working with this in 2018, it was with the first generation of these new transformer-based LLMs, which was uh, from Google. They had one um, they released back then called BERT. And the reason we started working with large language models and fine tuning them is because in the world of what we help customers deal with in talent, a lot of challenges come back to the question of skills data and understanding jobs and job architectures and skills about our roles, our candidates, our employees. And if you uh, fine tune a large language model, it becomes a very good tool to help build an effective job and skills architecture. And what we announced with Talent GPT is a culmination of that work that we've been doing since 2018, plus um, a connection to the latest conversational versions of how you can actually query some of those insights. And I can actually walk you through the, the examples, but what the latest wave in the last couple of months of conversational AI has done is made it a lot easier to bridge the gap between really smart job architectures and really effective algorithms for recommending candidates or recommending careers with an experience that's easier to use. But the problem with chat gpt and gpt4 is that out of the box those conversational experiences are highly um, risky in terms of accuracy out of the box those experiences don't actually understand your company and your candidates so you if you ask it to write a job description as in it being something like chat gpt it can write something that looks convincing but actually doesn't understand those jobs in your company at all for example you know most jobs mean radically different things in different industries and if you say um, to a large language model like ChatGPT, write me a job description for a product manager. It can write something that looks quite convincing, but it would be very inaccurate about what a product manager in your company is. But if you take the combination of something like ChatGPT with a proprietary data set and proprietary AI models about your company, then you can create something that actually can be highly relevant and accurate. Because if you, in a company where a product manager, for instance, is in animation, ask that question, and we, as Beamery or a uh, talent provider that understands your company, your jobs, um, is the actual thing providing the answer, then the conversational interface, something like ChatGPT, isn't providing any answers, it's just helping translate the question. It's helping you as a user be able to not go into a report and say, pick job, pick skills, but actually just ask the question, can you help me write a description? But then the actual work of writing that description, figuring out that you are a company in a certain industry is done by AI models that are not chat GPT. And that's that's essentially what talent GPT is. It's an ability to use our own proprietary AI models and our own proprietary fine-tuned LLM that we spent um, so many years building and connect it with conversational interfaces in a way that is safe, in a way that doesn't expose private company data. Um, we also have various filtering to ensure that there are guardrails around kind of how that data is used. Um, 
And, and that, you know, the experiences where it's embedded, whether it's for recruiters or candidates, are ones where you can leverage the best of those technologies in a way that is um, both safe, but also compliant and legal um, and doesn't um, put you at risk of falling foul of new laws, such as the New York AI regulation, um, by controlling how that data is used and how any recommendations are actually served by Beamery's proprietary models, which are audited for bias and so on. Yeah. Um, wow, that, that was... Uh... You said a lot of really important things there. I, I one of the uh, things I wanted to just make sure that we all understand: are you are you using um, only private uh, models, or are you using a, a, a combination mm. of private models that you mentioned and the um, LLMs from whether it's Google or OpenAI yeah. or ho wherever you're you're getting them. So it depends on the um, use case and experience. So in some cases, we're only using our own private models. Um, okay. In other cases, we are um, also connecting what we refer to as a chain, kind of a chain of different models. Um, so in a case where we let a, an employee, for instance, ask a question about who they should speak to, that's one of the use cases, and I can show you that, like which colleague should I connect with? We use our own models to, to do all of the data work, like. Who are you as an employee? What interests do you have? What skills do you have? But the conversational piece, allowing you as an employee to say, who should I speak to? We use GPT-4 to make that conversational question possible. And then our own models kick in to actually analyze all the data and give the, the recommendations. So in conversational experiences like that, we use GPT-4 for the conversational input mm -hmm. and then our own models. In other cases, we just use our own models because um, the, the beauty of what... I guess this uh, new chapter of interface design is about is that conversations are just the, the thing that's become more in the public domain. What's really exciting to us is the idea that we can enable, whether you're candidates or employees, more things to be assisted. Mm -hmm. And I think this sort of idea of what does assistance mean, it doesn't have to be that it's a chat. Assistance can be the way in which insights get surfaced to you in the right scenario. You know, think about um, I guess an assisted situation that um, uh, Apple released when they enabled you to get like a Wi-Fi sharing recommendation, like share your password when you're sort of near somebody who has a right. Wi-Fi. That's kind of one of those like magical assisted moments that's actually very similar to what is happening with GPT-4 in these models. So somewhere the Apple device or phone knows that you're near somebody who is your friend and that they can share a password, Wi-Fi password with you. And there's similar things that happen in like employee connections or manager manager discussions or recruiter conversations. You can have a, a, a moment of assistance that you can either choose to ignore or use that in the background is powered by these types of large language models. And that's where a lot of our proprietary work provides assistance without it always have to be, having to be conversational. Right, right. Um, yeah, that, thank you for that. that um... That really sort of, I know we're going to get visual with walking through some things, but it really helps illustrate it. My, uh, uh, one of the other things you mentioned was filtering and, you know, speaking to, you know, privacy, security, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I, I think, really critical. Um, so, you know, the, one of the examples you used was around a job description. Um, and if it was an external job description, something that a company today would just push out onto their website, there's mm -hmm. really no additional risk to putting that into um, out into the world via this interface or any other. But there might be other information that an employee mm -hmm. is asking about or um, or as a part of their question mm -hmm. that needs to be um, uh, more private, needs to you know not be put out in the world. So you're you're looking at use cases and, and your actual capabilities to mm -hmm. uh, to keep those where they belong. Uh, if, yeah. if you will. Yep, exactly. Okay. So let me, let me um, sh share my screen to walk you through a couple of Perfect. Perfect. examples. So I'll start with this, which is where we see the role of AI and Talent GPT, as, as I've started describing, is as an intersection between experiences. So in our world, this is sort of Beamery's product ecosystem. Experiences sit across talent acquisition, candidate experiences, recruiting experiences, hiring manager experiences, talent management, employees, talent marketplaces, development. But then you have all of these really important things that tend to be um, not embedded in what you as a manager or a hiring manager or recruiter would do. These skills architectures, these workforce planning insights and so forth. And one of the 
uh, really powerful opportunities with these new technologies is a lot of the background magic of understanding skills and jobs can actually now be more easily surfaced to recruiters, candidates, and employees. And the example of you know um, what you said with reporting or search is a good 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 scenario for this. So if you take a simple question like um, how is my search going? There's lots of questions you can ask about reporting. You as a recruiter might say, how's my search going? The answer might be, well, here's how many candidates you have. But there's a lot of cases where the question is an opportunity to help somebody ask more questions. Because one of the hardest things to do as a candidate, a recruiter, a manager, an employee is know the right question to ask. You wouldn't necessarily know that you could ask a question that includes predictions of how many days it could take or that there, are, there could be internal candidates that you might want to consider. And so one of the opportunities is using any question or even any context, you don't actually have to necessarily even ask the question. You as a recruiter, if you're recruiting for this job, we could suggest that you ask this question, even the question that you start with, we suggested, um, which goes back to the example I gave with that sort of Wi-Fi. You know, the moment of magic is that you didn't have to go into your phone and say, share your Wi-Fi. It just pops up and says, hey, this looks like a situation that you might want to engage in. And the same applies to, you know, other search-based questions like help me find engineers. We could answer that question with, sure, you know, here's some different features we have that could help. But before you jump into searching for these people, here's some considerations. You know, do you actually want to open this job or do you want to look internally? Um, do you want to consider um, collaborating with your hiring manager on how you want to draft this job? So we can prompt some of these suggestions. And the way that we look at this is, you know, you've had, I would say, um, two main chapters of what software is um, that have existed so far. And I genuinely see this as a third chapter. I think this is probably why also you have folks like Bill Gates saying this is the most interesting thing that he's seen or most revolutionary thing since you had the, the GUI or the sort of first interfaces invented. Because the first iteration of software is we, we now have visual interfaces. We've gone from computers being text to now you can click around. And the second generation of software is that those things moved into the cloud and became slightly intelligent. But fundamentally, they're still the same thing they started, which is screens where you click around and see stuff and do stuff. Like to run a report, you still go in and say, build report, filter here, do this. And I think this is a beginning of a new chapter where a lot of that software becomes something that can sit primarily in the background and can be embedded as widgets in assisted conversational scenarios. And this is what I mean and what we mean by talent GPT. The answers here are not coming from GPT-4. The answers here are Beamery features. We have insights around where candidates sit. These are the types of things you might be used to inside ATSs and CRMs. You could run a report saying, what is average time to hire? But the magic here is we can bring back that report without you asking for it explicitly or having to click around a lot. This is a this is not even an AI feature. This is a reporting feature, but it's brought up in the context of a simple search or simple conversation. And so this is the crux of uh, what Talent GPT is about for different stakeholders. Um, the majority of this is not... Uh, some uncontrolled new AI, it's just better user experiences that in some cases leverage the power of text understanding and text generation without the risk of using those um, large models for recommendations and those other things that you actually need to have as controlled and audited. Um, and the same principle applies to kind of where the opportunities and risks sit. So there's certain things that um, we are being very cautious about in terms of how we actually release things to customers, not because of the data risks or the recommendation risks, but because of the information we want to collect to understand what's the actual impact this has on, on improving people's choices. You know, if you look at um, job descriptions, to go back to that example, if you asked a product to generate you a job description by clicking on a job catalog and finding it, that experience might make you less likely to just copy and paste the description to a candidate than if ChatGPT generated, because there's something interesting about how we respond to conversational experiences, I think, you know, as most human beings, um, that seems to be potentially more trusting than if you sort of click in a job catalog and find it. And I think that question of how do people um, actually use these things as assistance rather than as, as just something you take as a default is deeper than just how is the data generated it's like what's the actual experience of how you get there and i think it's important to be thoughtful about that so i'll give you an example so let's say that you go into this is a an example of the under the hood um uh versions of how you can explore data so let's say that we 
I mentioned product manager earlier, so let's do that. So let's say that under the hood, you have um, a technology that understands your job architecture. Now, if you access it by clicking something like this, pick a job product manager and access it by then saying, augment it by skills, let's say in animation, the way in which you might look at this data is, wow, that's interesting. But you might be less automatically trusting of the insights just by virtue of this being in tables and boxes, mm -hmm. even if this is actually very thoughtfully accurate about your company and your jobs, than if you tried a um, conversational version of this. So for example, let's say that I say um, here, um, and this is an, another example of AI, which is embedded. Let's say I pick a skill like this, and then I say, why is this skill relevant to a product manager job in animation? Now, I can take the same principle of this, this sort of job architecture and skills architecture, but suddenly I've made it conversational. And then here, this can give me an underlying explanation, which takes into account descriptions and so on that sit in that job and skills catalog. But the output is conversational. And inherently, the feeling of this data is different to a feeling of a screen that just sort of spat it out on, on, in a table. And I think these are the important nuances around um, not just where is the data coming from, it, can we trust it? In this case, this data can be from your company's fixed job catalog, um, but how do we package this information in order to, to get the right outcomes we want in terms of what recruiters, managers, or other folks do um, with this kind of information? And the same principle applies to uh, you know, how you let people leverage these types of insights. So I'll give you an example. Um, so one of the areas where we're quite excited about the opportunities is uh, of using these GPT-4 parts of the experience, the sort of external conversational parts, are in making some of these um, underlying pieces like this more fun and more playful, but while keeping the guardrails of still use our own data and ensure that all of this is auditable, etc. So an example of something that's more can be more fun and playful is um, in creating more peer-to-peer -peer connections and collaboration. I think it's often the case that we think about uh, AI and software is replacing our experiences, but a lot of the most interesting opportunities are about actually encouraging people to come together rather than to uh, replace what decisions you're making, how you're interacting. And one example of it is this. So let's say, actually I'll do it here. Let's say that you, this is an example of like an employee profile. Um, and let's say this is you as an employee. One of the things we can do is make the idea of connecting with other employees and making yourself um, surface more playful. Now, LinkedIn did something with this as part of their onboarding. They started using a summary generation as part of their onboarding as a, as a LinkedIn profile. And the same principle of, well, why would you want to summarize your LinkedIn profile can be applied to um, the context of how do you encourage employees to engage with talent marketplaces, mentoring projects in a way that is more engaging. So for example, let's say this is my profile. Rather than starting with a conversation, I could start with, do I want to write my profile or do I want to get some assistance? But we can generate um, summaries of uh, and encourage you to then connect with other people who have those types of profiles or experiences. The other thing that you can consider is what's the interaction that makes this safe or easy to use? Like if I go to LinkedIn, which is one of the places where these summaries exist, what's a way in which I would want to use this experience while having guardrails? Now, a button with a summary is guardrails, um, but there are other cases where the guardrails could be um, uh, less obvious depending on what the interface was. So this is an example of a product that we haven't released, but as a, an example of where guardrails are important. So I could pick your profile like this and do the same type of thing, but say, for example, um, say, write an offer letter. Now, in this example, this is kind of, let's say, suggested text. In this case, I'm going to offer you a job, um, George, as a head of product at Beamery. What looks on the surface as uh, an assisted experience is, in theory, um, risky, not because of the output, but because of the freedom of choice I had of like picking your profile, being on LinkedIn. We wouldn't necessarily want this to be as simple as that, because people might then just copy and paste the email, which isn't necessarily the best action we want. What we might want is for people to be more thoughtful around how to review this before sending it. And you can see here, it's like, in this case, your profile is here and we can see that from your profile summary, which is public um, uh, on LinkedIn, this is certain experiences that make you relevant to Beamery. And in the background, the Talent GPT tool recognizes what that head of product Beamery, uh, role at Beamery looks like and why actually that experience might be relevant. But we wouldn't necessarily want the product to be packaged this way if we want it to be used very thoughtfully and safely. And it goes back to the principle of how in order to make this stuff um, not just work well and leverage good underlying models, which we have, 
we also want to ensure that the experiences before they're rolled out into the wild are packaged in a way that is as um, carefully reviewed as possible in terms of driving to good outcomes. And that is really the crux of how we are thinking about the embedding of this, either in employee experiences or recruiter experiences, leveraging those Beamery audited models, but also being thoughtful about the actual interface and what makes this um, as easy and thoughtful to use as possible. Yeah. Um, well, you you actually uh, impressed me several times in that uh, in that whistle stop tour with those capabilities. And I see a lot of products um, and I, you know, we're talking a lot about this. So um, I'm really impressed with what you're doing and the direction you're headed in. Um, one of the things that you, you talked about um, that I really want to underline a few times here, that skills taxonomy that you, that you pulled up, um, that is the heavy lifting in moving to the skills-based organization. And um, I know that one of the, things about AI and machine learning is it, it keeps learning, right? As, as we're going. So as the, as that job description example that you were using, um, if that continued to move forward through the process and then get published, you know, the, um, that adds to the veracity of the taxonomy and has a trickle down effect to the employee thinking about what path they should be on. And, the learning, um, you know, the chief learning officer looking at, you know, the skills available in their workforce and its relevance long term. I mean, the the my mind just starts racing with, you know, how this um, adds value uh, yeah. upstream to the organization and down to the desktops of every employee, every candidate. Mm -hmm. um, it's really interesting what you're doing here. Well, I think it goes back to. Um why we're being cautious with not just the AI, but the experiences and ensuring that there is the right level of assistance rather than automation. Because our goal here is to find that balance. And if you think about the, to your point, like the hard, the hard part in a lot of this is ensuring that the quality of the insights around our clients, which are companies with jobs, skills, candidates, employees, is as accurate as possible. And a lot of that comes from not only some sort of background data or AI, but from actually being connected to the client systems, right? So our clients' data that is feeding our understanding of their jobs is coming from their HCM, their ATS. This isn't some sort of um, assumption-based model. We're actually looking at who is a company hiring, what do we understand their employees and seniorities? And that's what we've built over you know, the last um, almost decade now uh, in conjunction with us being able to compare each of our customers' jobs and roles with labor market data. We track over a billion profiles, hundreds of millions of jobs in order to understand the evolution of what do skills mean, what do jobs mean. And that's stuff that isn't um, generative AI. That's stuff that is underlying insights, which in our case are tracked in kind of a graph of data that understands context. That is a form of AI intelligence, but not generative AI. But that is the foundation, the bedrock that allows these insights to be relevant. How do we understand whether... Uh, a learning course is relevant to you as an employee or, or a, um, a peer is worth connecting with. How do we understand for you as a recruiter, which skills to suggest for your jobs? That's essentially the, the non-generative stuff that we've had for some time, but not, it isn't necessarily as fun or playful as an experience. And I think right. going from that stuff being available to it being really fun and easy to use is where we have to be deliberate around not just generative AI, but around how to uh, really help people use any form of AI, not only safely, but in a way that is assistive and not automating anything. And one of the boundaries we highlighted with our Talent GPT release is we don't touch generative AI or anything that's an external uh, AI in anything that involves a recommendation. Anything that's a recommendation inherently should be um, bias auditable and audited by third parties, mm. um, especially if it's a recommendation for who you hire, at which point it becomes a compliance question. Um, but you need to be able to not only um, trust these things as a user, but as an organization, you need to know how do we check why this thing happened? Um, and with large language models um, like ChatGPT, you can't sort of audit it, right? You can't find out why did it make that recommendation or how do people use it? But the underlying points around, for example, job architecture, what a client uses, the difference between it being um, assistive versus not is often a case of what do you see side by side? If I just write a job description, my choice to review it is different to if the suggestion was then 
Uh, do you want to see how to make this more inclusive? Um, do you want to see what the number of candidates that might be um, relevant to this job based on the current skills rather than just on a description? Like the, the choice shouldn't just be about help me write an email or help me write a job. It right. should be about um, what am I trying to achieve with this and how do I see a set of choices as I'm going through it? And I think it's it's um, the same direction that you know we've seen companies like Microsoft and Amazon going with what they call co-pilots or whisperers. Um, how, how do you find a boundary between automating something and providing assistance? But in our case, that boundary isn't just about assistance, but deep knowledge of a company's employees, candidates, and jobs in order to make that assistance really relevant to them rather than being something that could be highly inaccurate. Right, right. Well, um, I mean, there's there's clearly a lot for a Beamery customer to get excited about with this. And I know it's just the beginning. Um, how, you know, is this available now for Beamery customers or, and you know, how, how are you rolling it out? Yeah. So as, I, as I've said, we, it's available now, but we're being very cautious about rolling this out in alpha programs and beta programs to our customers. And we, um, we also have a, um, uh, a partnership with, with Microsoft and we're looking at some of the ways of uh, expanding the way, the, the sort of rollout models of this and partnership with them. So there's a number of things that are, being tested over the next couple of months, a big one being what is the, as I mentioned earlier, the impact on people's choices? Like how do we make the assistance as thoughtful as possible um, in terms of the way it's packaged into the experience? And in essence, we've run these alphas and betas in four areas. We have one that focuses on employee experience, one that focuses on the experience of managers and hiring managers and how we can assist them in getting insights, one that focuses on the recruiter and sourcer experience, um, and one that focuses on the candidate experience. We have um, ways for candidates, for example, to find out which um, information about the company is relevant to their interests. You know, rather than just browsing career sites and um, or using chatbots, you can take all the information in a company's career site or about their employer brand and make it easier for a candidate trying to understand what types of events does this company run or what's their approach to diversity to be more easily surfaced, whether they are looking at the career site for the first time or coming back to an existing application. And so there's a number of experiences um, that we're testing out in alpha programs with customers today. And I think uh, over the next couple of months, we we should have a better idea of which of these things are um, embedded in you know the most useful experience um, and how to best roll it out to yeah. um, to everyone. Well, that's great. I, and I you've you Beamery, as I mentioned to you previously, you have a, rep, a reputation of being thoughtful, and um, you know you're working with some very large employers, and you've you've you know, you're smart to be that way. So thinking of the um, uh, the folks that are on the user end, the customer side, um, and stepping back from Beamery for just a second, but just in a general sense, I, I think you've touched on many concepts um, in the way you've approached this that are areas that they might, they might be thoughtful about themselves as they're considering um, how can this help us? Do, do you have any, you know, one or two bits of advice for folks that are um, mm -hmm. on the customer side thinking about it, implementing this? I think the first piece of advice I'd give is it's really important to look at the safety sides of this as it is with any form of AI. And it's not just a question of, what is the one law coming out in New York, for example, which is very narrow in its scope in a way that only looks like applicant decisions or hiring decisions, but what is a way in which we can think about these technologies as opportunities to reduce bias, opportunities to improve collaboration? And that's partly a question of how safe is the technology, partly a question of what does change management look like? How safe is it to pilot these things? You know, one of the reasons we're being careful, not just on the, um, legal and ethics side, but also on the experience side is there are really exciting opportunities for how this can encourage you know peer-to-peer -peer connections, but it's the kind of thing that um, is going to be somewhat unique to each organization in terms of what is the thing that drives the most value and how do you change the experience. You know, encouraging collaboration between recruiters and hiring managers would look different in different organizations. And I think it is a really um, important time to think about how do we create pilot programs about these things? How do we look at it in terms of a broader strategy? Um, I am sure you know most companies are um, starting to look at incorporating various forms of AI in parts of their business outside of recruiting and HR. You know, companies are looking at this in areas like support, marketing. So obviously, there's going to be um, 
parallel strategies emerging. And I think it's important for uh, HR as a, as a function to really be at the tip of the spear in helping shape that strategy, um, shape the strategy of how what can we do to find out for our organization what could be the most valuable component? How do we frame the success criteria of a pilot? How do we test, you know, is this compliant? Is this auditable? Um, and those things, I think, can be evaluated not just with external vendors, but with even internal things that a company could build for themselves. Um, you know, it's not just a case of how do we use a technology like Beamray, it's how do we actually form a strategy around enhancing experiences with not only AI, but being more thoughtful around skills, being more thoughtful around um, transparency of where this um, data is coming from and how we understand, you know, what we should be recruiting for in our organizations, how we use these insights. Um, so that would be my biggest advice to, to embrace the evaluation and embrace the testing side of this as, you know, we already see organizations getting a huge competitive edge out of it. Um, but that doesn't mean you just suddenly roll it out to everyone. It means you you validate the the, the best path forward um, through review and um, and testing. Yeah, yeah, that's great advice and uh, well put. Um, Sultan, thank you for doing this. Thank you for uh, your transparency. It's always a pleasure to catch up with you. Uh, and I'm, I'm really happy to share one of our catch-ups with them with the market. And uh, I certainly learned a lot. I know folks will uh, will really appreciate uh, everything that you shared here. Thank you. My pleasure, George. Thanks so much for, for hosting. Glad to talk about this. Sure. And thanks to everyone, uh, wherever you're watching from, and uh, I look forward to the next.